Hi, everybody. Great uh, to have you with us today. This is a bit of a, an experiment uh, for all of us. Uh, normally, we go to these big events and gather and, and connect at, at these. But due to the COVID uh, corona crisis, uh, we are doing this in a digital way, which is very appropriate for digital finance to see if we can leverage what we used to do in the physical world, in the digital world. And without further ado, I will introduce the first and the last speaker of the day, and you've all seen the program in between. Uh, we have Alexander Stevens, who will introduce us for the European Commission. Uh, you work in the division, the FISMA uh, division there, um, as a policy officer. And we have Saar, who will close the event uh, uh, at 11.30 with a wrap up of everything that you will be learning and sharing this, uh, this morning. So, to keep things short and concise, I know, Alexander, that you, we, we attributed half an hour to respectfully give the commission the opening floor, but you already told us that you're going to keep it very short. Exactly. Go ahead. So this is a public consultation. So the purpose yes. is to hear from you more than you hearing from us. More than happy to answer questions and uh, what we heard so far, what direction we're heading towards. But the, the idea really is that we've launched... Uh, now, a month ago, our public consultation on digital finance, and yes. by Q3 this year, we will come up with a new strategy for digital finance um, with the new mandate of President von der Leyen. And, and the idea is that we wanted to organize what's called now the digital finance outreach, meaning we would uh, go to almost all member states and meet the digital finance stakeholders in every country. Um, we did it in Italy, we did it in the Czech Republic, then the COVID-19 crisis started and we decided to convert everything online. Yesterday we did the first uh, online event in Germany and today we're doing it in Belgium. And I want to thank FinTech Belgium and Febelfin and the Ministry of Finance for organizing this well. I, I honestly, and it's not because I'm Belgian myself, but I honestly, uh, upload uh, what you've done. I, we, I, we, I see that we're already 200 online. So it's yes. really great to see um, how booming is, and, and, and strong is the FinTech community in, in Belgium. And maybe to quickly interrupt you on that for those 200 people who joined us, thank you very much for being with us this morning. You will see that at the top of your window, you can choose between chat questions and polls and people to check out who else is joining this session. But in the chat part, don't hesitate if you have questions. This is the closest you will get to policy uh, making uh, in the online world. You can directly feed your feedback into the European Commission who's preparing the upcoming legislation. Yeah, So uh, do use this. Uh, as said before, uh, Saar from Sibylfin will be uh, cl cl have a closing uh, summary of everything that's being said, but don't hesitate to get, a con I would say, a discussion going here. And I think we're all confined at home, or at least many of us still are. And so uh, you can do the multitasking of looking what's happening in the chat window. From time to time, we might um, uh, see, see some people already discovered the question part. Um, and I hear that Luc van Tomme is hearing a big echo, he says. So thank you for that. That's not a question, that's a remark. So you can share it in the chat, but uh, others say it works for them. So it's probably the audio setting for some people. Watch out if you if you come on stage. This is a warning to the speakers to uh, to not put your volume too loud if you're not using headsets uh, to, to get the echo. So that might be one thing. Um, people are saying that it works fine for them, so that's great. So without further ado, I interrupted you for the interactivity part. Uh, people start using, so that's nice to see. Go ahead, uh, Alexander, tell us what and, else, uh, why we, you reach out. So we reach out because um, we we realize that the financial sector has really evolved and digitization is now more than ever important, and especially in the current context where in a lockdown situation, only you can only open an account online or bank online or any other mm -hmm. financial products and services are offered online and that digitization in a way is a way of hedging operational risks and keep going. And we bet that actually the, important of digital, the importance of digital finance will keep increasing and growing over time. And, and, and now is the moment to hear from you. You are those okay. on the ground, you are the innovators and we wanna hear from you new ideas on how we could promote more digital finance in Europe. So there, you, in the agenda today, there's four topics. There's more in the public consultation. Um, today is a way of interactively discuss this, but I also invite you to 
submit your written contributions to the public consultation that will be open until June 26th. And I also yeah. invite you to participate to the other webinars that we organize. So tomorrow at 10, we will talk about the section on tech neutrality and uh, having an innovation friendly uh, regulatory framework. And every Wednesday at 10, we cover once the consultation with stakeholders from across Europe. On the other side, I also invite you to, to attend the national events. So I see here in the participants that we have colleagues from Ireland and, and from other countries that will actually come after Belgium today. So they're taking example of and, and getting an idea of how, how uh, the platform works and, and how their own national events can, can take place. Okay. So really, I'll, I'll be short. I'm happy to intervene at any point during the, the conversation today. Thank you for all of you to, to be online. And let's go ahead. Let's, um, we're, here to, we're here to hear from you. Okay, we're always very happy with this sort of snappy introductions to, to get to the, the content. For you to, to raise the interactivity, you can use the chat window to put some of the URLs where this work is happening, these Monday, yeah, these Monday meetings uh, where people can give the feedback and so on. Uh, for other people, don't misuse the chat, please. You can, you can put hyperlinks in there, uh, but uh, it's not for auto promotion or other purposes. So put the right content in there as we can all expect from the professionals you are. And so we have Jean-Louis, the chairman of, um, of FinTech Belgium, uh, who's joining the stage now. Uh, he is the CEO of Moniz, uh, an electronic meal voucher uh, platform that is extending uh, this uh, platform to all sorts of, with all sorts of financial uh, uh, related services from what I understand, uh, Jean-Louis. And together, uh, I didn't introduce myself, my name is Ton Van Acht. I'm, the chair, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Data.be, uh, a Belgian FinTech uh, structuring business information and uh, mandates. Uh, so that's uh, how both Jean Louis and myself uh, uh, co-founded uh, FinTech uh, Belgium, and we are a grassroots organization, and we've been using this Livestorm uh, platform for the last few weeks uh, to keep contact with our community. And so we thank the European Commission for this invitation also, and the other partners, uh, Fidelfin, uh, Fat Finance, and also the National Bank to be so active in contributing to uh, sharing all this information. So Jean-Louis, you prepared uh, an, a slide deck about the digital market for uh, financial services and how we look at that from the fintech perspective. So I said, put on the fintech hat and we look forward to the, the slides you prepared for us. So thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Very good. So uh, you have done already some, uh, some of my first slides. So thank you very much. You are sparing some time for, of, uh, of my speech. Uh, tone. So, uh, as you said, my name is Jean Livano. I'm uh, so president of the or chairman of the of the board of director of fintech. I do that for more than two years, and it's a great pleasure to uh, actually share with you uh, a survey that we made. Let me put this screen on the full screen. And that you were reading my thoughts here. Thank you, Jean Louis. <laughs> really, I'm I'm hearing your thoughts, even yes. though we are going through uh, electrons and stuff. So. I will have. I will try to not to take more than twenty minutes uh, in order to uh, allow maybe some time for questions. Uh, for the questions, I think that there are, there is a, a little chat a potential uh, on the side of the of the tool of the webinar tool, so you can use them. And then uh, I believe that Tone will gather the questions and will try to uh, save some time. Uh, later to respond to these questions if you need any. So uh, just a brief word to the agenda of the day, a very quick word on the FinTech Belgium, who we are. Uh, then we jump onto the feedback from our members. So in order to prepare this, uh, this presentation and the, the proposal that we can uh, bring to the uh, EC, we have uh, surveyed our members and they came uh, with some good ideas that we uh, obviously summarize in this second part. The third part are really the FinTech Belgium proposals. And I will explain you uh, how we come up with uh, these proposals, turning the feedback of the members and also some others, and then the conclusions. So on the right hand side, you can see the a mapping on the Belgian FinTechs, all our members, and you can see that uh, the, 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 the breadth of uh, technologies and competences that we have in Belgium is very broad. We are covering all, uh, if not uh, every aspect of the fintech technologies and innovations that you can see in uh, other countries or regions from payments, investments, uh, infrastructure, crypto, 
insurance, reg tech, accounting tech. So we do have this breadth of, of capabilities and businesses in our country and as members of FinTech. So we are, as you said, you know, we are the recognized federation of FinTech in Belgium uh, with more than 100 members in finance, insurance, accounting and regulation. Actually, we opened up insurance, accounting and regulation over the last two to three years to recognize the move that is happening in these markets. To become a member is very clear. You need to be providing financial services, you know, as a broad sense. You see there all these technologies that you that you could have, you know, asset management, wealth, investment, as I said, open data, big data is very broad, including obviously open banking and cybersecurity. Uh, you need to be innovative. Uh, you need to or you need to improve the industry or address some emerging or ex existing issues uh, that we may encounter. So we are neutral, independent and not profits. Very important. Um, there is no big people that are trying to, uh, let's say, say what we should say. We are very free. Uh, it's a freedom of speech, as we can mention. What are our missions? Being the voice of fintechs in Belgium. So we're actively promoting the fintech sector in Belgium. So we have many activities, summits, meetups, and even during the COVID-19, uh, we are doing uh, webinars uh, every uh, every weeks, and uh, that are also managed by our uh, preferred MC Master of Ceremony Tone, that does a fantastic job uh, together with the association. Um, we relay also uh, with other as internal association, and that is what we have done also to prepare actually the summarized responses to the proposal we want to make. Um, we are a platform of dialogue with uh, the regulators, so we have uh, very uh, often uh, contacts with the BNB and BB FSMA. We are also in regular contact with the Ministry of Finance and some other bodies, um, whether fully uh, public or partially public. And we are obviously in contact with the financial ecosystem, Fedelfin, with whom we have partnerships as well, Agoria, BFCs, EBF. The idea also is to share experience and knowledge and information within and outside our community, uh, as we said. So you can see that uh, together with this community, we have regular contacts with the fintech uh, community, you know, reaching nearly 300 and 3,500 people and contacts, which helps us really to, to reach, you know, on a broad sense, uh, our financial community in Belgium. So let us uh, jump uh, without further ado on uh, the uh, core of the presentation. So um, over the last few weeks, we have sent some survey about, you know, to our members to understand their point of view of what should be a digital single market for the financial services. And there uh, we have summarized eight, uh, let's say, proposals that have been uh, given by the members. Obviously, we give them here kind of, uh, you know, raw material so that we give uh, the chance of everyone to, uh, let's say, speak out uh, what their meaning is. Maybe in some instances, we are not fully in, a, in full agreement due to maybe some lack of information of complete information for our member. But I think it's good for you to have the ties on the ground and to understand what is living, no matter what uh, emotions uh, that could be brought. So I will run rapidly to these uh, eight summarized uh, proposals, and then we go afterwards to kind of more analyze type of proposal, if you allow me. Uh, obviously, difficult for you not to allow me unless you just cut the wire. So number one is open banking. And the idea is really not to limit the, the bank to bank accounts, but to all the other financial products. Obviously, if you want to do PFM, personal finance management, if you can have not only the current accounts, but also what's the spending on the credit cards, what are the savings accounts, what are the investments and securities, you could be uh, proposing a rather larger um, value to the consumers, not just to mention these. So that is proposal number one. Um, proposal number two is that the legislation should really support customer centricity and usability. 
So some members see that the legislation is really there only to regulate and protecting the consumer, but they say that they, the legislation should also really focus on what is the source of a lot of new uh, fintechs, and that is to focus on what the consumer wants and how he's going to use and as such consume uh, financial uh, services. Maybe to add up on that for everybody watching, the next session in, in uh, 15, 20 minutes, we'll, we'll be focusing on exactly from, from the banking and the regulators' perspective on this open banking aspect and the customer-centric approach there. So uh, stay tuned if you want to learn more from, uh, from others on this topic too. Exactly. Uh, thank you for this uh, addition, uh, Tone. So three, legislation must be more supportive to startups. So you can imagine that the newcomers are very, um, you know, motivated and enthusiastic. And obviously, from when when you start from the end user needs, and when you, when you go through all what is needed in order to providing this system to have access to the to the to the market, obviously some startups might think that the legislation should be more supportive to them. Another one which is pretty interesting and in that we, um, I must say, we received a lot of uh, proposal in this direction is really the elimination of gold plating on national level. So the way the, um, the regulations is translated in national legislations uh, makes the possibility for the legislator and the local legislator to put some uh, more um, pressure on uh, what could be done of course, in order to be protective to the consumer, but obviously more coherence between all EU regulations will really eliminate national discrepancies, not just for the sake of eliminating them, but also to make sure that players in some countries could have access to, the, to a broader European market with less uh, hassle and uh, uh, potential um, issues. Number five, the regulators should communicate in clearly the rules on what must be achieved by new entrants and obtain licenses. So on that one, I, you know, I allowed myself to say that maybe we not fully share exactly this view. We understand that again, with the enthusiasm of uh, putting, to, to putting some new services onto the market, there are things that you need to do in order to have access to the market. And uh, it is at, at least for Belgium, our humble uh, view that's an experience with the regulator that they do a pretty good job at communicating the rules. Having said so, regulators should draw attention of the new address on entrance on the risk management. And obviously uh, within our community, we strive always to sensitize our members to duly prepare their files and to have a big attention on risk management. And on that aspect, we do have some, uh, we propose some sessions also uh, in order to educate um, our members and sometimes in collaboration with Feeblefin. Number six, boost the digitalization. Obviously, what is proposed here is that the policymakers and regulators should lead by example and stimulate it. We'll come back to that, but they, of course, the people are very specific on, you know, the way they are submitting their files, all the interactions that are, that are driven, and they would want that with all interactions with the regulators and policymakers would be allowed in 100% digital uh, mean. Number seven, giving a clear additional mission and mandate to the regulator, and that is promote digitalization and single market. So this is really a, a translation of the previous points, but as the mission of today, the regulator should have a clear additional mission in order to promote this digitalization. This is something, a very strong proposal here. And then last but not the least about equity requirements. And uh, some of uh, our members are really requiring that these and the equity uh, requirements should be proportional, proportional to the risk. Obviously, when you are proposing some starting services, you know, uh, the risk that you can um, create for your user is far less important than whether you would um, propose that to a broader a range of uh, consumers or clients. And one key aspect here is 
and proposal is to be able to take the provided innovating technology also as an asset. So that is not only to uh, value the equity, you know, the investment money that is brought into the company, but also to evaluate what technology brings and in order to make it more proportionate uh, between the two means, technology and money. So that is a, 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 a broad summary of the member proposal. So what we did now uh, in these two slides is to make seven proposals that are, that are taking obviously into account that the, the, the feedback of our members that we just um, outlined and then also uh, with discussions uh, with, uh, within the board with some members, but also with some other organizations abroad, um, we have been uh, able to publish these seven proposals. So the first is really to stimulate a single EU market, but not only on payment. So we believe that PSD2 has been a good example of what can be done on payment. But as you've seen, you know, financial services are incorporated far more than payments. So for other services that we mentioned here, securities, insurance products, corporate bonds, asset management, crowdfunding and lending. As you know, crowdfunding is not really harmonized as far as regulation is concerned uh, in Europe. Credit card information and savings. So what we see is that in a nutshell to uh, really summarize what we say, favor use of regulations over directive. And the, re the big difference is that regulations applies automatically and uniformly to all EU countries. You know, GDPR is a good example of this nature of regulation or legislation. Second, harmonization of the application of EU legal acts. So obviously everybody agrees that eliminating the potential of local gold plating and discrepancies would really allow the people to strive and to in, into Europe and to create more bigger players and with more bigger markets for actually the, in, the same initial ideas and investments. Of course, let us not forget all the differences in taxations and the likes that are leading to many fine tuning per country. So not only on the financial services legal acts, obviously you know that taxations income statements, in income uh, taxation, um, and also company taxation are overall in, uh, in Europe different. And this is obviously something that are preventing the ease of deploying European services. So it goes behind uh, the, the financial le uh, legislation. Three, clarify the rules and legislation around blockchain technology in Europe. So that will be also a, a subject uh, that Marc Toledo will speak about. But obviously, when you clarify the more and the, the faster you, cl 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 you clarify the rules, the faster you can attract people to exploit these technologies. It is not by accident that Libra chose uh, Switzerland in order to position themselves on that technology. So it is really important that we clarify how to use blockchain as an enabler of exchange of financial instruments and also to be very clear in what context this technology can be used for example as alternative currency or as a mean to exchange financial assets and and again i'll, I'll do the same thing as i did uh, before we have a, a separate session on this afterwards well this will be covered more deeply by uh, industry experts so uh, not just the fintechs but wider too. So that's uh, another uh, call to stay tuned and learn more about this uh, later on. Thank you, Tern. So when we speak about that, I just like the previous point, not only for financial assets or financial services, but also it will be blockchain as a technology should be, should, should be clarified on the legislation and regulation level on a broader sense and also including that and clarify this uh, uh, legal frame in order to also make sure that even non-financial digital assets can be covered, the crypto assets. 
So the next four uh, proposals that we should have, four, is stimulate innovation in general, sandboxing in particular. So again, we spoke about the mission, the mission of uh, when we discuss uh, with the local uh, national bank or regulator. Obviously, they are very open to the starters. Uh, they do have the single locket and a single, speak, a single point of contact, which is very well organized but it's not the omission of the regulator to enable innovation. And when we see what's happening in the UK or in Singapore, we understand that adding this uh, mission could really open up new breadth of services and value creation. Number five, stimulate open banking and open data for all financial assets and services. So we understand that and uh, opening the bank data and the way you can consume products is really boosting the creation of new services and obviously um, using this very well-known artificial intelligent technology. Leaders are obviously outside Europe. They are in US, Canada, Toronto, China. And uh, as you know, Thierry Breton is also pushing into this direction because he's fearing that uh, missing this point will really endanger the, 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 the growth and the value creation from our European companies very fast. As you know, big data, you have data, but you have big. So you need really to have this data and to make this data available for the player in order to draw the best predictions using, for example, with artificial intelligence. So it is really important that we put a very massive focus on this number five proposal. Number six, gen stimulate the generalization of full digitalization of the underlying infrastructure. Obviously, the financial services are all digital. But you know, if you look at the life cycle of the way you are creating this value, uh, these uh, financial services or new financial services, you are yet a lot of moments of positions of of um, of timing where and milestone where you need to put that into paper, where you are uh, you know using incumbents of either administrative means or processes where if you put an underlying infrastructure that care for all these moments, you are eliminating all these contentions. And D here, we just uh, mentioned a few of them, cybersecurity, digital signature. If you want to have the, a, a full digital process, you really need to make clear legislation about how digital signature is robust and accepted by the administration digital authentication, identity management. And here, as we said, again, starting from public bodies and leading by example is critical. And that has been done, you see, you know, in Belgium with players like It's Me for identity management uh, in order to also other players to sort the, uh, re, uh, safely store the, the files on a digital way. It is of paramount importance. When you see, look at some countries um, in, the, in the Baltics, and you see that when the government says we are fully digital, obviously investments and innovation is going there massively. Last but not the least, stimulating innovation by reviewing equity requirements and valuing technology as corporate. As I said, we believe that this is a very important for some new players that are developing innovating technologies that are allowing, thanks to your use of the technology, to diminish the risk of the consumer, that the regulator should take that into consideration. So these were seven important proposals that our association is making in order to create the digital single market uh, in Europe for the financial services. So as a conclusion, we can see that digitalization and innovation is truly the only recipe for successfully developing financial instruments in our region. And clearly, the only benefits would be to provide these 
new innovating services for consumers and for businesses. We believe that new stimulating legislation and homogeneous regulation can undoubtedly restore EU leadership. This would create really a unique single market that can really and truly overtake the current leadership of others like Asia and US. We could also stimulate the emergence of larger and stronger players. So today, if you look at the financial uh, uh, contenders, they are pretty much split around all the countries. Whereas when you look at two other, you see in the top 10 uh, players on the world, you see only Americans and the Chinese. So creating this, um, this homogeneous market will help us to have strong players and to make sure that these strong players also could be strong also in some other regions, thanks to the, the uh, power they can um, build on our region. So it also create and foster new players in the fintech. And in doing so, we are also able to attract massive in mass investment, not only from Europe, but for from other regions in order to provide and to fund these new players. So we believe that it's up to the EU citizens to strive towards reaching this goal and then being able to formulating such a big ambition and that is very much restore the leadership of Europe. So thank you very much for your attention and I think that we have five to ten minutes for Perhaps yeah, that's that's the great uh, advantage responding. of having uh, such concise introduction by the commission and you keeping a good track of time yourself. That we have we have questions lined up. I don't even have to invite people to start asking them. Now there's a bit of confusion where you should ask the question. So I will I will show how that how that works. Uh, there is a question tab. If I do a start live answer, everybody will see that question on their screens and it will also be included in the web video that we share of this uh, webinar afterwards. If you uh, only put your um, question in the chat, uh, that's typically for side comments. So like Olivier uh, Rouclou just did, well done, well done Jean-Louis, that would be more of a chat comment. If you have a real question, uh, well formulated for a speaker, please use the questions because then we can do the live uh, answering like I do now. And this one would probably be more for uh, Alexandre. Uh, with regard to taxation, eh, the, it's not the EU competence yet. Uh, uh, how uh, how would you go on that question? Because it's not uh, it's clearly that, and it's outside of our remit. So okay, and regarding the equity requirements as well, those are elements that I will not address. But there's um, thank you very much, Henri, for 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 your proposals. Um, and I, I, I'm just going to say a few words on a couple of them. So. You, it is true. Legislation fosters innovation. It is it is important to have, to some extent, a sort of competitive mandate, and that is part of our consultation on knowing how can we have a innovative, innovative, friendly regulatory framework. Um, you mentioned that it will also help EU uh, get back its leadership. I think the EU, the Europe, has still a leadership in this. Um, we. It's called the Brussels effect. So you saw GDPR, you saw PSD2 open banking. It started in Europe and many other countries elsewhere are applying it as well today. So the legislation that we came with has been influencing um, um, and many other jurisdictions. Now, in terms of um, moving uh, to the next step, so beyond open banking, expanding PSD2, we're looking into open finance. Uh, we're looking into open data. Um, the Commission came up uh, with a new data strategy um, and um, that has a more horizontal view, whereas we, as DG FISMA, will look into the financial sector. What are the specificities to uh, enable more data sharing within the financial sector and what are the specific risks um, that uh, apply um, to that specific sector? And um, that I, I think we have another session on that data today, so we can go more in depth on, on that topic. I saw a question uh, by Carsten Hess. So, yes. Carsten, it's good to see you again. I think we replied that question last week, um, but definitely we'll make sure that there is a level playing field and that everyone will be able to 
um, compete at a, with, on, on equal terms. Uh, to make sure uh, everybody got the question right, this is about the, the tension for big techs and regulation and making sure that uh, uh, there is some market left for uh, European players and not just big tech uh, eating it all, to put it bluntly. Exactly. Um, Jean-Louis also mentioned the, the importance to generalize digitalization and make it uh, now a sort of requirement. It is true that what's now analog is suboptimal and having a digital framework and, and it's the best way. And we've seen it today in the lockdown situation. So are we moving towards imposing some sort of digitization in the financial sector? I cannot say now, but surely it might, it might head that way. So um, one specific element is you mentioned digital ID. Today, without any digital ID, we can open any open, uh, bank account or perform any financial tra transactions. We have It's Me in Belgium, but what are we going to do at the European level? So we're also looking into that. And that's also leads to the single market idea that if you are able to uh, have one single way of onboarding and getting authenticated in Europe, um, that will help you then to... Um, Get it, get involved with financial products and services all across member states. So that's uh, something point. Peter Smith just pointed out. Digital identity should have been agreed upon as interoperable standards across all jurisdictions. So I think that's indeed uh, uh, another participant to this webinar uh, putting it uh, uh, in in a different way, but uh, exactly. going for the same uh, conclusion. Yeah. So we do we do have ideas, but now it's also about harmonizing uh, anti money money laundering rules. So. Um, and, and, and that's also one of the big elements we're, we're looking into now and, and see how we'll be able to have one single uh, digital ID uh, for framework for all of Europe. Um, on on legislating uh, crypto blockchain, that's another topic today, so I'll talk about it uh, more. But of course, it's important to have legal certainty. So what we did so far is that we've there, we, we split it into, so um, we, on one side, you have um, the existing financial legislation that will have to be adapted um, based on, 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 uh, on to, to be able to accommodate crypto assets, but there are also, also crypto assets that do not apply to our legislation. So we will have to come up with a new regime. So um, we had a public consultation that ended in March. Uh, this year, we got a lot of um, responses. We've been going through them, and um, we'll, we'll, we're now starting to prepare the leg legislation. So stay tuned, and 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 I'm sure um, there's there's more there's more that can be elaborated on that in, in the next couple of months. Um, on how to promote innovation and sandboxing, sandboxing is key. So I'm not sure we can create legislation that will favor startups particularly. You have to have a level playing field, but definitely there, there is a possibility and, and you already see it. Almost all member states have innovation hubs. Um, five of them have regulatory sandboxes. So in your slides, you've mentioned the FCA sandbox that sometimes even focuses on specific sectors. And like maybe Alexander, I'm going yeah. because we always assume I mean, I think that's amazing, that everybody knows what a sandbox is when it comes to developing new financial services. How would you describe it for those who are, who are new to this concept? So, so just to be very simple, an innovation yeah. hub is like a website with all the information. For example, you've mentioned how to, to get licensing and, and having in, in clear steps. And it's sometimes even a, a phone line that you can call and get help. A regulatory sandbox is goes a step further. It's actually the authorities that take the hand of, of, the, of the project of the team and try to see how the legal framework can adjust based on, on the new financial products and services that they want to offer up until the day that they get fully licensed. So it doesn't mean they exempt them, but it means that they accompany these new uh, innovations. And, and, and just to put in perspective with today and the COVID-19 crisis, we see that there's a lot of uh, drug trials, experimentation that are speed up. Yeah. And probably in the digital finance sector, that should also be a necessity because we see how important it is in the current context. 
So sandboxing in a way is helps to um, not block these new innovations, make it possible and see how to get there. Both the, the, the authorities and the private sector can create more welfare for, for consumers and society in general. So we can see the sandbox as a vaccine trial where the where the regulator will closely monitor what happens with the patient and if it if it works you can uh, you can ship it to uh, to more uh, consumers and end users exactly and so concretely what we do now we have what's called the european forum for innovation facilitators since uh, april last year and we gather all the authorities in europe and they discuss with each other what are their best practices when they see new projects how do they uh, monitor them and, and, and what should all of them do to coordinate more European level. There's been a lot of discussion of setting up a European sandbox um, and have a one-stop shop where you would be able to test your, your, your um, project in various member states. There's, um, and, and, and there's been also how, because sandboxing would allow you to exempt you on a temporary basis your national rules but what about the eu rules that are mandatory so we're also looking into that what rules are hindering innovation and how can we adjust to that i, I took the liberty while you were answering to put the question that was in the back from kun van der hoydonk who was asking like how the unusual events such as COVID and brexit uh, how, uh, uh, how can we address them in the EU single market? But I think they've been addressed with a nice uh, sample on uh, uh, on sandboxing and uh, putting that in line with the mandatory EU rules. So uh, thanks for thanks for that answer. Um, we, we're going to take one more question, and I, I want to I, I would really want to keep the leap start we had uh, in in this very uh, interactive and dynamic start that you gave to this uh, webinar, uh, so that we have some more time for this sort of interactivity with the next speakers. Um, there was a question on security um, I'll, from Jean Pierre Cournet, who's asking uh, that yeah, it has been mentioned as we go doing more banking transactions on smartphones. Uh, how do you see the smartphone initiate banking transactions from a security perspective? Is there something specific that you would look at either from a European perspective or uh, Jean-Louis from the, 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 the FinTech community? What do you hear about this uh, cybersecurity risk of uh, mobile? Jean-Louis, please go ahead. Um, I, I can mention a few words on cyber resilience afterwards. So, so obviously, uh, you know, managing security is about no knowing and understanding the underlying technologies. So, uh, you know, as I've seen in the question that some people, uh, you know, earlier, a uh, few, few years ago were saying, well, it will never happen. It is not secured. And when you look at the technology stack, obviously, you are able to um, make these uh, device uh, you know, as secure as you can use for your PC. I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but um, but I, I don't see anything preventing uh, people, you know, on the one way to imagine some secure way of using a new tool, which is based on computer technologies on the one hand. What you could have, obviously, is, um, is new scams uh, or, or new ways of maybe coercing people and... Uh, and uh, you know you, you need to have some more triggers of on on the security you know there is a difference between the physical security when you go on the bank and you are in the closed environments whereas if you can you know make some uh, good trading stuff working in the street um, and uh, push some millions of your assets from one from one bank to the other one obviously if you are in new york in harlem or in some other places maybe it is not a good advice to do so so there are two things you know the, the security should be looked at on on the broad on on the full picture you have the physical ways what's happening there and you have obviously the technology so not only technology should be should be uh, let's say uh, the focus alexander and you want to add on yeah is that we also had a consultation and in march on digital operational resilience and how to make sure that the financial sector has the required framework and rules to um, counter the cyber threats. So we're actually working right now on, the, on a new legislation and, and to make sure that the requirements across Europe, both the whole financial sector uh, are the same. So again, um, I see that this is one specific example of, of uh, smartphone transactions, but we're, we're really looking 
uh, at the macro context, what can be done? How can we promote that? We've seen uh, best practices in the industry and in the other sectors, and we're trying to make sure that all of that is harmonized across the EU. Okay. What, what I can also add is that all these new new legislations of new uses are also opening some kind of new players uh, onto the market. You know, you, we are more and more, we see in the startups, uh, whether fintech or not, more and more companies uh, focusing on cybersecurity with a very uh, in-depth expertise on that matter. And on the other hand, when you have new legislations and regulation, we see also in our regulation tech, uh, mm -hmm. practice we see more and more people able to bring some new services to the market and most of the time to the existing major players so uh, the more we regulate a as such obviously and to the benefits of the consumer it's not legislation for the legislation the more um, opportunities that creates uh, from players uh, to provide new services that's great. Thanks. Thanks. I'll, I'll consider that as uh, done answering uh, <laughs> this question. We have another remark it, it, uh, from Bridget Carroll. She is from TransferWise, uh, I think one of the, the oldest uh, uh, European uh, fintechs, if we can even still call them that way. Uh, she's saying that if Europe wants to be truly a hub and, and, com and compete with big US firms, attracting and keeping talent needs to be better addressed. And she's hinting at the issues of share options uh, to, to retribute to that talent so that they can share in the success of their uh, of their fintech but um, severe tax penalties in some markets including Belgium which was a concern from them moving to Brussels uh, is there something uh, for, I know the tax for the Commission is out of your out of your way but Jean-Louis something you want to say about that uh, from the fintech community how, how we feel about that well how we feel about it <laughs> as you know I think that the what, what, what we believe is that uh, obviously um, keeping the people uh, in um, and finding the right people and keeping them in, uh, in our country is very much linked to the project and to the ambition of the project. So, so obviously when you see in the, in, the, in the conclusions, you know, if we create larger players, it's not only because the people want to go to massive player, but when you have massive player, you, 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 you also create some kind of dynamic. Of the smallest and the and the biggest one, and that creates perspective for the people to remain inside our our the remit of Europe, and that and that's critical. Obviously, then uh, linked to that is the way you can compensate, and um, you know some talents uh, can be attracted not only by you know money, uh, and the one I referred here is really about projects, and obviously yeah, there are some regions where you pay more. But uh, creating uh, certainly these massive, um, these massive players would allow people to earn more money in uh, in our region and hence remain inside Europe. And Bridget also made a suggestion herself was to create a European equity stock option program with rules that would apply everywhere. Uh, I think specifically for Belgium, what I've heard in the past that it, and we have the ministry, uh, I would say the, the foot finance as a, as a partner for this session. Uh, the, the complaint we get a lot is that it's being taxed for employees at the moment they receive the options, not when they execute them. And thus there is a high uncertainty if they accept those shares at that point uh, because they're, they, they can be relatively highly taxed on that without having any cash benefits at that point in time. So it's about when in time do we find a due uh, tax scheme where you don't have to upfront for the risks you are taking by joining uh, an uncertain company and at the same time uh, balance it with uh, the European tax uh, obligations, especially if we're going to have to pay back all the, the, the COVID measures that are being taken now. So uh, something to think about. Thank you, uh, Bridget, for, for adding that to this discussion. We, we, we've seen, so this, we are aware of this problem. It's up to member states. Uh, France came up recently with, mm -hmm. with a new framework on this. Key. It's, it's important also, we have many fintech hubs across Europe, but it's also important they all work together. Of course, it remotely helps talent to, to, to work at one, as, one, as one EU fintech hub instead okay. of various member states. Yeah. But also how to get that talent from outside the EU, how to bring them inside. So in the UK, you see visa schemes and so on, but that's again up to member states to, to determine. Okay. Great. Well, with that, we're going to keep the, the 10 minute head start that we have for the rest of the, the this morning program. I would like to thank you, Jean-Louis, for the, the preparation of the, the FinTech community. Uh, and I'm going to ask the next uh, three speakers uh, to join us on stage. Uh, Alexandre, you can stay, but uh, they have prepared. So it's Tina Holvoet, 
who's the open banking specialist from BNP Paribas Fortis. Uh, I will just say their names so they can start coming on there. It's a little bit awkward in the real world. They're lined up next to the stage. Here they have to uh, find the, uh, the right button and technology has to be with us. We have Reno Temmerman, who's the payment advisor at the National Bank of Belgium. So that's the regulatory oversight who has uh, agreed to join us for an interactive session too. And we have Jean de Kral, who's the CEO at uh, Isabel Group, uh, who will be very happy because uh, we had in the in the, in the shared uh, chat, uh, Philippe Verschure, uh, who was already promoting the Truly Us service, which is an It's Me for Business mandates uh, that was has been announced by Isabel to become available later this year. Uh, so that's about the digital identity in B2B. So while we're waiting for those speakers uh, to come on stage uh, and let me see if I have a, a parallel chat because we have a group set up uh, as, as backup technology we use this device huh? so it's uh, it's all very digital to see how the next speakers can indeed uh, join us on the on stage um, I'm multitasking here to see if I need to do something to facilitate that well give me one second uh, and I, we also have a team behind the scenes. So Caroline, if you can help me getting the other speakers invited and on stage, feel free to find that too. Because uh, the interface, we have 223 people on there. Thank you very much. But it means I need to scroll through a list to make sure I can find our uh, speakers in there to invite them on stage. So that's what I'm doing now. And I see that one of them already found a region. Thank you for joining us. Um, you're the CEO of Hi, good uh, Isabel Group. We can hear you, so that's very good. You're up. Uh, Renat and Tine, if you can uh, find a way onto the stage, that would be awesome. Um, and in the meantime, while we wait for them to join us, I would say uh, let's uh, maybe introduce uh, Isabel Group because we've been talking PSD2, uh, which is largely seen as account aggregation payment initiation. That's something that Isabel Group has been doing for over two decades now, multi-banking uh, on the Belgium level. Uh, and you've moved into uh, adding a lot of fintech building blocks uh, over the last few years with Isabel Group. Can you tell us a little bit more um, ab uh, about uh, uh, Isabel Group, before we start the, 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 the discussion on promoting a more data-driven financial uh, uh, sector. So Jean, go ahead. Yes, Tom, with pleasure. So, um, yes, with pleasure, uh, uh, Tom. So as you, as you said in your introduction, uh, uh, Isabel is, is basically pre-PSD2 for the last 25 years offering multi-banking access in a, in a, in a B2B environment. Uh, we've been evol evolving in uh, offering services uh, beyond payments in the context of uh, electronic invoices, but also in the context of uh, uh, identity uh, and managing identities, uh, uh, but purely dedicated on the uh, on the B two B market in order to uh, solve basically friction and hassle in the B two B processes, both from an order to cash as a procure to pay uh, process, and we are an actor as a, as a market infrastructure player, uh, combining basically pipes and data with a series of other actors uh, to uh, reach out to the, uh, to the end customers in, uh, okay. in the corporate or in the enterprise world. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, Jean. Uh, Tina, we're very happy to see you and I'm truly impressed because you found the right wear. I, I, I like the data reference you put there. Is there, is there more on the, on the sheet? So it's data center. Oh, wow. So you are the data center of BP Paribas Fortis or you at least represent their uh, open data and open banking strategy, right? So my, f my official title is Beyond Banking Experts. Um, that okay. brings us to indeed a single market beyond financial services right away. So good morning, yeah. everyone. Uh, I think that is indeed the, the future and it's not only about payments. Um, yes. I'm indeed not surrounded by people, but that's why I like to be surrounded by clothes and uh, objects. So I am in my spam office uh, being <laughs> a data center. And obviously, I'm taking uh, the discussion always to an uh, ethical um, point of view. Uh, what if indeed it becomes a hype to be your own uh, data broker? Uh, in our discussion, I would like to be a more conservative voice maybe there. Okay, I, I, I don't know you as being the conservative voice, but I look forward to discovering that one. Uh, Renat Temmerman, uh, you are here uh, 
you're employed by the National Bank uh, of Belgium as a payment advisor, but uh, we were very happy to have you on this stage. But I need to make the fair disclaimer that everything you say will not be used against you uh, and that uh, th these are personal opinions. So uh, <laughs> uh, we, we appreciate the fact they have the regulator in these in these efforts, but everybody knows that your statements cannot be taken uh, uh, as, as, a, as a new official guideline, right? So uh, thank you for the knowledgeable insights. Can you tell us a little bit more as an opener maybe uh, how the National bank looks at promoting a more data-driven uh, financial sector okay um, good morning everyone um, so yeah uh, everything I do say is indeed uh, my personal opinion unless I specifically say it's the MBB's uh, point of view yes. um, so I don't speak for the governor uh, yet um, at any rate so our um, data driven basically our role is essentially as a national competent authority under PSD2 the data uh, the open banking instrument that is currently mm -hmm. already implemented is to make sure that becomes fully operational uh, and there are a couple of significant challenges I think in that regard ahead and we can look at that as we go through uh, perhaps questions will be raised um, our main priority today is to make PSD2's access to payment accounts work um, and we've taken several steps and we can elaborate on that with the industry, both non-bank TPPs, third-party providers, as well as banks to try to make that work. So, and that's our, that's our main point of view, as well as at the same time, of course, we are responsible for the IT uh, safety and security and IT supervision of all banks and all payment institutions and e-money institutions in this country. So we also look a lot at IT supervisory issues and at cybersecurity uh, in general, for okay. market infrastructures and for banks and all these new players. So. Okay, so you can comment on the first question on mobiles because they're being used massively by millions of consumers in Belgium. I'm not aware of any huge uh, problem that has been reported uh, in that in that field. So the comparison, the question we had earlier on our mobile uh, phones uh, secure enough to do financial transactions. Well, I mean, sort of, you could perhaps sort of compare it to, I mean, I, the question started with saying one IT expert wrote. I yeah. Mean, so, um, honestly, I mean, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you've ever worked like in a meat factory, you're likely to be a vegetarian. So, um, <laughs> so, so, that's probably why yeah. some of IT experts are likely not to use some of these services mm. that they help to create um, to a degree. So, we need to take that with a grain of salt, I think. Um, um, we do look hard at um, IT supervisory issues and making sure, the, as, as Jean-Louis said earlier, we understand the underlying technology. I don't work in the IT uh, department, so I went to law school, unfortunately, so my IT knowledge is limited. Um, but we do look at these solutions uh, in detail and try to make sure that they match the existing framework in terms of IT security. Okay, great. Thanks for that. That also means the National Bank has technical experts looking yeah. and reviewing those uh, technical aspects of uh, yeah, digital finance. We do, and every every license application, as I'm sure you know with PZ2, a yes. lot of the uh, new requirements are on the technical mm -hmm. side, uh, both for TPPs and how to access banks. On these APIs, on how it needs to work, it's technical. Uh, more than legal, even it's technical, um, and we do have people who are specifically uh, looking at that and assessing those files um, and from the IT security point of view. So. Okay, great. So maybe Tina, if you wanna wanna uh, kick off here and tell us a little bit more about how you see this data driven, and especially when we talk open banking and how strict or how wide you see this uh, happening. Yeah, we discussed this before, um, PSD2 and payments and open data, it's clearly just the catalyst, it's the start, um, and it's a massive change uh, that is happening as we speak. Actually, I see um, the change that happened over the last 10 months, uh, individuals and companies um, are learning to talk tech. And it's like Rena just mentioned, a lot of people working in financial sectors have an um, economical or a legal uh, background. Um, but you see these big players um, pivot towards becoming a real tech company. Uh, that's an international trend. And obviously, open banking is catalyzing this. Uh, probably the main factor for success is to make sure that tech IT departments are able to speak with the business um, uh, departments, marketing departments, and that's probably also where an open banking team or open banking experts is valuable for any company to really um, catalyze a mental shift and, and 
also build the capabilities, not only IT capabilities, but human resources uh, to reskill them and, and to make sure that everyone knows what is an API, for example. And that's maybe a question for a poll. Um, yeah, how, how, how mature are you um, in embracing tech in your daily job? Okay, I will, I will write a poll uh, while, while uh, Jean tells a little bit more about APIs and uh, where he thinks they fit in that stack. Okay, well, I mean, uh, the, the API, I would say uh, uh, another technology in that respect. What we, what we see, however, we see we see that as a, as a future evolution in the uh, in the in uh, the interaction of two parties uh, consuming a service. Uh, today, typically in a banking environment, before PSD two, uh, most of the time, when you are you, when you are your consumer or when you are a, a company trying to uh, with your with your bank or with with a vendor through an e-commerce site or whatever, most of the time you are confronted with a screen. So you have a, a, a human machine interaction. Uh, the API will, will facilitate basically a program talking to a program instead of having a human being talking to a program and accessing the data or interacting with the service. Uh, and that can facilitate a series of, of services. Uh, I'll, I'll give you just an example in the, uh, in the context of what our clients are using. Today they are using a, a a corporate front end to access uh, account information in banks and initiate payments. But when you are in a in a corporate environment, uh, you, you most of the time would like to see your the balances of your account straight in your accounting package or straight in your treasury application. And you asking yourself, why do I have to go behind a screen uh, of my bank to extract that data and then repump it in another application where that data just would, would be better immediately over there. Uh, if you look at an invoice, you receive to directly to go to another application and go and, and in the front end of a, of a bank in order to initiate that payment. So the APIs will basically help uh, these use cases to be implemented and consume the services that a bank is going to offer uh, at another place, which is potentially a better place. Uh, and, and that's all the, uh, the, the, the richness, I think, of the fintech community is to think about other business cases, about other use cases to facilitate uh, consumption, to facilitate access and to offer uh, uh, added services. And that's where the API comes into in order to allow two, two applications to, to talk to each other without, without a human being in between. Thank you very much. I was multitasking by launching the poll. And uh, so normally, if everything went fine, you should, uh, the people should be able to, uh, to see a poll there. I hope it's the case. If not, uh, something technical went wrong while I was unmuting. Um, but so we're asking if, if you have uh, what your experience is on the APIs, and I don't see it here. So I really hope I'll probably have to do it again. Uh, so while I type the poll again, yes, Tina? Yeah, if I may, I will fill the room um, while you are uh, dealing with the technical uh, aspect. Thank of the you for poll. that one. I'll start again. Yeah. Go yeah, um, and I would like to add, indeed, um, you you see that indeed when you connect uh, data, uh, you enter the collaborative space. Um, and when I earlier mentioned that this is a huge mental uh, mentality shift for business people as well, so not only for tech uh, departments, it's really um, coming from a competitive background towards this collaborative space and um, seeing how you uh, should collaborate with other parties. Um, but then, and again, focusing on the tech for non-tech aspect, um, if you think about talking about TPPs, eh, third party uh, providers, payment or other providers, um, you see how we lack to make this um, attractive. If you would talk about partners, then immediately in business um, terminology, uh, people would also be more open uh, to sharing um, and, and they would see uh, how indeed business advantage is to be found in this collaborative space. And that's probably the most important uh, shift uh, that is taking place at, as we speak. Thank you for that, Tine. Uh, Reinhard, maybe your, your point of view on, on the, the open banking part here? 
you're muted. Yes, now it's fine. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yeah, okay. So yeah, um, our point of view on the open banking, I just saw I just saw a question um, from someone that, that goes through that, um, that goes through to the heart of that, is um, that some Belgian banks, is the question, still appear to struggle in providing high quality account info uh, through APIs to some fintechs. And I think that's our, that's today and for the coming months, and I think at least uh, until the end of this year, our main um, objective is, as I said in the beginning, is to make it all work. I mean, it's 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 fine. We can discuss a lot about high-level policy that's important, but then ultimately that policy needs to be translated into something that works, that can that can work for a fintech to build a stable business case on. Um, and we all want that to go through APIs. The reality is there are some challenges uh, in all the member states. Belgium is no exception with the customer journeys. And, and how um, the access today works to the APIs. Um, some of that is due to interpretation of the law. Some of that is due to um, due to the operational stability of some of these APIs and the information that gets provided through it. Um, and I think we've been very proactive the last few months to try to get everyone around the table. Um, we've seen fintech separately. We've seen banks separately. We've put them together in the same room. Um, and we are um, on the verge, I would think, of, um, of, of doing some, some things that will try to boost what is needed um, in the Belgian implementation of, um, of APIs to make sure that open banking actually works. So, um, and that's, that's, our, that's our main uh, goal today. And we are scrutinizing at the same time and also at EU okay. level the customer journeys through APIs. Um, harking back to what Charlie said in the first session, Customer journeys are vital. Uh, it's one thing to have um, to have an API. If that API creates a really crappy customer journey, it's not going to be used by anyone, and we're going to see a continued use of alternative techniques about which we have serious um, um, let's say reservation from an IT security perspective. Okay, thanks, Jean. Maybe you, can you add what what, what do you think that is needed to 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 get there? Yeah, I would like I would like to add something. Yes. I mean, uh, based on the question which was being raised by by Daniel uh, Verbrugge, uh, I think in Belgium we missed an opportunity of collaboration and working together on those mm -hmm. on those things. Is what we experience is that uh, every party has been starting the uh, the uh, legislation uh, their own way. They're making their own interpretation on that. Some of them have been uh, looking into a very strict uh, implementation of the legislations. Uh, Others have made their their own interpretation on that one. Uh, and which is basically leading to a situation where there is a there is a lot of work. It's, it's it's good for a company of ours, but that's that's not the purpose of of getting an open API uh, environment in the context of PSD two to open and boost, uh, uh, I would say, uh, creativity and initiatives out of out of the market. Uh, and we are now at a stage where uh, through uh, new associations such as the local associations which have been created for uh, representing. The people which have uh, AISP, PISP licenses, such as A78, where there's a collaboration which is now taking place uh, with the National Bank, but also with the other uh, parties on the Belgian market to try to address all the nitty gritty details, uh, which could have been tackled uh, probably up front. So it's probably now too late <laughs> uh, at this stage, but I think the market is going to have to think much more. Uh, uh, open and much more in depth if we go to next phases of PSD2 and if we go to go beyond payments uh, accounts uh, of, of having a much more collaborative approach uh, in that in that respect uh, in, in the scope of what the legislation allows in terms of collaboration etc so not to make it uh, in, in the context of the competitive flow regulation but there's plenty of room uh, to do it in a much more effective way which is going to be beneficial not only for the banking sector from a cost perspective but also from a standardization, from a security, and, and from a regulation point of view. Uh, and I think that's a lesson learned uh, based on these first phases where I would, I would really uh, uh, call for better collaboration in the future for upcoming uh, opening of the markets uh, towards securities account, towards saving accounts, towards whatever type of data uh, which we would like to open uh, towards, the, uh, towards the markets. Uh, because we see in other countries where that collaboration effectively took place, that that it's that it's creating a competitive advantage for the players on that market, basically to come into Belgium. So it's 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 
we're shooting basically in ourselves in trying to be much, too much protective and, and trying to invent it all in our own. Yeah. I would like to I would like to confirm that from 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 my point of view, from where I'm I'm looking at it. Um, I think a key requirement before we can start talking about when we go to implementation about opening up further accounts to to open uh, to access beyond payment accounts mm -hmm. when we talk about open financial data in the larger sense is that we need more harmonized APIs. We need more corresponding uniform customer journeys, basically, because today it's like comparing it to the wild days of, you know, early railroad building in the United States, you know, different companies building different tracks where trains cannot run on the same track. Um, if we keep having to switch tracks and switch trains all the time, we're never going to get a cross-continental railroad, so to speak. Um, and, and basically the API aggregator role and its popularity, and that's my personal view, is, is an unwanted side effect from my point of view of, of the current way PSD2 and, and, and its level two legislation has been drafted. Um, that should not have been necessary had there been a better cooperation or a better standard emerging as a European standard or as at least for a few countries together. Um, and I think that is badly needed as a prerequisite before we can talk about blowing it open on a regulatory phase um, into all other kinds of, of data. Um, Okay, I, I really like that trade metaphor there. It's a very strong image that speaks in the mind. And uh, I, I think that things have changed over the last few years where banks were very hesitant in the past to open everything. Uh, and Tina, this is a question for you because you come with an academic history and then you moved and joined a, a very large, uh, Belgium's largest bank. H how do you see the, the, the how the banks react to this idea of openness today as maybe five years ago and uh, when, when PSD2 was still seen as a threat by many of them? Yeah, that's why I focus, and indeed you can call me soft. Uh, I'm often uh, referred to the person speaking about technology in a very soft mm -hmm. manner, uh, because indeed it's a people's business. Um, and uh, indeed building the tracks together is the main uh, effort. Um, I, I, that's why I also uh, shifted from academia to, to building uh, open banking um, or, or guiding towards new open banking uh, solutions. Um, it is happening now. It's really happening now. And I, that's what I said earlier. I would not compare with five years ago. I would compare with five months ago. And okay. as people are building it right now and solving problems and having a dialogue with other developers, um, it is being realized now as we speak. And I would like to comment on the fact okay we should wait until to open things up for accountancy data or social secretary or whatever other data mm -hmm. beyond payments um, maybe we should indeed uh, rethink uh, building legacy PSE2 is not about building new legacy it's about pivoting and it is not too late as Jean mentioned earlier okay maybe you have um, uh, a learning experience and that allows you to pivot and pivot and iterate and do this more quickly and that's why agile and lean have been buzzwords for many years now but it's only when you work in a lean structure uh, that you actually sense mm -hmm. the importance of um, uh, pivoting and changing your par parkour your, your way of working mm -hmm. uh, if you feel that you cannot make it and um, obviously, it's important for people to understand tech, whether it's Exco or um, uh, the one uh, building a business uh, opportunity. Um, but on the other hand, you also need uh, to have people that believe that we should not build huge blocks that will not change in the coming years, because that's an old fashioned way of working. We should build lean stacks and, and APIs actually literally are the bits of, to plug and play. So you're, you're confirming that you're moving from the monolith uh, approach to a more uh, agile block approach where you can where you can plug in and, 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 and use new services easily. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, and it's also being um, translated into frameworks. So that's where yes. the, the monolith and the, the startup meet. Um, in for BNP Paribas Fortis, it's, it's a lean, it's an agile ex exercise that is being um, put in place right now. So the frameworks that are very big and stable and across mm -hmm. countries are um, giving some space 
to move beyond uh, slow processes of control towards more uh, collaborative processes and partner choices and um, beyond uh, yeah, this old um, way of thinking to push your own product via your own channels through your own customer base. But that's indeed the mentality the shift that is happening as we speak. Okay, that's great to get confirmation on that. It's good to have you back, John, too. And uh, Renat, maybe question to you, because uh, Tina just opened by saying we should not just look at this for the classical, uh, I would say, financial products, but also add new type of data, which are not covered under PZ2, which are not as standards uh, available yet, which are very local often. Uh, but when, once we talk about social security uh, data, um, I would say saving plans uh, and others, how do you feel about that as a, as a regulator? Because it's going to be a very challenging field because it's outside of your, your comfort zone for you as well as a, as a financial regulator. Mm. My comfort zone is pretty wide, but uh, that okay. of the national park may be smaller. Um, yeah. um, no, well, um, I think I mean as somebody who's been who's been who has been involved with and, and mm -hmm. a, a role at NDD is trying to make things oper operationally, as to this day, supervise mm -hmm. how it operationally in the nitty gritty details actually gets to work. Um, I think it's 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 good that there is a policy view of, and I support that of, of including more. What we're seeing today in the market in Belgium and across uh, Europe, I think, is that players are not waiting for regulation. Um, regulation, mm -hmm. fintechs and PPPs existed way before um, PSD2. Um, today, all kinds of financial data is being accessed by players in the Belgian market. It's just being done through other uh, techniques, um, which we have our, our, our doubts about um, at the MDB in terms of how safe and secure these are. So I'm definitely to scraping or that sort of techniques scraping, as well as scraping, yeah. scraping, scraping yeah. as well as the reverse engineering the way it's called yes. reverse engineering it's not really that but um, of, of mobile um, mobile banking apps, apps yeah. today, um, which does expose some sort of weaknesses or exploits as kind of weakness mm -hmm. point in, in the mobile banking applications um, we are not huge fans of those techniques. We do understand why they are still used. We do understand they are used beyond the scope of what is regulated today and is under the supervision of the NBB. Um, I am personally in favor of including all that scope of financial data in a regulated fashion. But we, I do want to come back to the point that Mr. De Prat also made, Sean made earlier, which is we do really need um, a more harmonized API structure and a customer journey that is more detailed. Um, that doesn't mean I want to volunteer myself or the European Union or legislators in having to draft that. Um, mm -hmm. I think we made a consensus decision a few years ago in the RTS that basically created a, the whole setup of, of how open banking or PDT needs to work. We made a constant decision back then to say, we're not gonna write an API standard in a piece of European legislation that can only be reformed every two or three years after a lot lengthy process and a lot of talks. Um, this needs to come from the industry. We have seen industry initiatives. Um, what we do need perhaps in the future, and this is just thinking out loud, is some of these industry initiatives to come together and then like the way we wrote the uh, guidance or the guidelines on how um, SEPA credit transfers work, these initiatives, these API initiatives then need to be mandated perhaps from a European point of view, but they need to come from the bottom up they need to come from the industry itself. So. Okay. And and and, and Jean, you being both, uh, your company is uh, partly owned by banks and you work for them, with them, and you're, a, and you're a fintech, so you have many different sides of this ecosystem in which you are involved and need to deal with every day. How do you feel the changed mindset to come to real Belgian APIs? Because that was one of the problems and it was left to the, uh, the, the Belgian ecosystem to get this, uh, I would say, uh, structured and documented. We've seen serious issues with that. Now we see we want to do that. Uh, we don't want to regulate it at a higher level. We want to leave it to those local experts and communities. Do you think there has been a mind shift that a next edition would go faster in those requirements on how to connect big players with each other? And Jean, I hope we haven't lost the connection yet. We just lost the connection, so uh, we have the, the the a technical issue here. Uh, I will I will move the question uh, to Tina to see in to which extent oh, Jean is back. Yeah, we see and hear you again. Sorry. Yeah. It's, Did you it's, get the question? A, I have the question. It's, yeah. Great. It's a okay. Very, thanks. It's a very, as you can imagine, it's a very touchy question, and I'm not going to talk course, on yes. behalf of, of of the banks themselves. I think uh, at the origin, uh, through Fabelfin, there was a decision of not working together on the APIs mm -hmm. because it was considered 
more in, in the context of a, of a competitive nature uh, in that yes. area at, at that time. Uh, I think you also need to consider that that uh, banks have their own priorities and they have their own roadmaps and their own and their own challenges uh, uh, today and and their current priorities is maybe not to try to start opening all their data to third parties to start uh, 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 building solutions which can be add-ons or which can be competitive. So you're always a little bit in that in that in that area. Uh, yeah. I think I think uh, things are evolving, uh, but it's going to take time. I think also some parties sees the possibility by saying, "Hey." I can maybe monetize that data. I mean, if, if I if I open my gates, maybe there is a business case uh, which which can be uh, be built around that. Uh, and and we'll see and we'll see what the, what the future will will dictate. Uh, with trying to make a pro PSD two to start talking about banks about uh, defining standards on accessing, for instance, uh, credit cards uh, data. Mm -hmm. uh, very important in the context of B2B, if you're asking an accountant when you have to retype everything in that respect, uh, with looking into securities accounts, etc. But at this stage, it's much more in a in a bilateral discussion okay. which that, that takes place. And I think it's primarily because the strategies of the banks are still at that, at that, at that stage uh, different. Uh, uh, I think to come back to what Tina said, uh, it's, it's a learning experience. I think there's still a lot to do on the, uh, on the payment space. Uh, by learning the first implementation of PSD2 and seeing what, what works and what doesn't work and trying to see if we can have banks collaborating on that area before we start a new area. Yeah. And, and I think in particular in a B2B space, the PSD2 legislation has not really been taken into consideration all the different aspects in the B2B. It really was really much more focused on the consumer environment. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we face basically got a, a lot of, of lacking elements uh, in the legislations. If you're looking at the consent um, yeah. uh, aspects related to that, I mean, you need to give your consent uh, on a periodical basis uh, on that on that respect. Imagine you have multiple accounts for a, for a company, and that and that the legal rep needs to uh, reply uh, and, and and confirm that consent. The notion of a legal entity is not is not considered basically in the legislation. It's all about the individual which have an access to an account, which is a typical mm -hmm. historical uh, banking approach, uh, and which are elements where maybe which could be reconsidered in, in the context of, of the B2B uh, 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 environment. So I think there's still a lot, and I'm talking B2B because this is, yeah. this is our specialty. Uh, there's still a lot to do on the existing legislation, on the existing payment accounts to fluidify the usage of the API and to try to align banks on that one before we start uh, aligning banks on, on new initiatives. Okay, yeah. I think those are very valid points. Also for the summary that Sa from Fibelfin is preparing uh, to, to talk about this consent and, and, and the mandates linked to that. Uh, Tini, maybe you want to say something about that too, because when we're talking about open data and not just open data of the government, but other third parties, uh, how do you see this consent and the user uh, knowledgeably knowing what they're sharing with whom, to which extent, and what their rights are around that. Can, can you say something more about that? Yeah, um, the idea of consent is a difficult one. Um, most uh, organizations say that they consider sharing data when a customer is giving consent. Uh, but then again, we see that if you want to use an app, and you can use this LiveStorm app as an example, uh, when you want to use it, you give consent. Um, if you would go to Runeuf and you ask people, uh, okay, in return for a free service, would you uh, sign this? Um, you give consent. And uh, there are a few people who um, uh, left Facebook or WhatsApp. Uh, you see it happening in Corona days. Uh, suddenly you share things through WhatsApp because your family members want you to. Uh, but you should be aware that you're actually sharing much more uh, sensor uh, information uh, when you use that kind of app. Um, so it is a story about uh, sensib sensibilization and um, information to to customers. And then, and that's why I mentioned I am happy to work for a more conservative organization uh, to this respect because uh, BNP Paribas Fortis is not willing to um, uh, monetize uh, personal data um, even with consent because we have, uh, and that's being reconfirmed by Exco, we have the impression that. Consent is not enough because people would uh, not understand um, or, or don't 
uh, are not aware of what they're signing for in every situation. Um, then again, we, we want to be this financial trust company and we want to guide people. And maybe in some years, uh, you could see that people are aware and there is a new reality on um, how you deal with giving or not giving consent. I um, refer back to the first question. Is it safe to pay through an, um, a smartphone? Well, it's indeed typically uh, developers that would not use technology because they, they design it themselves. And I want to refer to an older story um, before uh, digitalization. Uh, people working in excos of banks would never have only one um, bank account because they would also see and know how the system is working and they would be the first multi-bankers uh, typically and would have six uh, different banks' uh, accounts. So indeed, the more you know, the more doubtful you probably are. Um, Regarding um, uh, a consent, we should also move away from the idea of the individual. Uh, what is your unit? Is it the? It's, it's more, and that's why I'm wearing the sweater. It's more than people that become uh, brokers of their own personal information. It would be smart to work and to monetize even uh, data that goes much beyond uh, its company information, but it can be bigger. Uh, and if you think about platforms and, and ecosystems. Um, think of the of the ecosystem of living and housing and mobility. What interesting data streams do we have? And we have Belgian companies like RoboVision who are actually going beyond uh, personal data and are um, developing much and more interesting solutions as we speak. Uh, not even uh, ticking the box of uh, giving consent. So I'm, I'm taking the question out of scope. And, but it's because it, to me, it's not about the just the consent box, but it's the bigger framework of us dealing with consent and maybe over uh, stressing the importance of personal data. Let's change the unit and go to the to the house block, the car, the um, train, the uh, mm -hmm. parcel of ground, uh, land, um, and and see what we can do with that. I don't think you're taking discussion out of the topic. Eh? Also, if I look at the comments, thank you, uh, Bridget Carroll. Uh, again, you're very uh, interactive and giving good uh, uh, suggestions here. She's saying, yeah, a, a lot of uh, people are using the data portability under GDPR, which means that you as a consumer or a business can ask uh, GDPR is personal, so not the business, drop that one. But as a person, you can ask a big tech, give me everything you have on me in a structured format and then either move away or go elsewhere. So uh, that that goes against the argument of people don't know what they give and are and are not aware. But that's a very small portion of consumers that is yeah. probably aware that they have these rights under GDPR to ask a full copy uh, of their of their history. Go ahead. It's probably the the people that also have their location set off, and I'm including <laughs> that kind of group. <laughs> so you're part <laughs> of that small group to, of knowledgeable. To, to be people. quick, yeah. if you want to uh, uh, use, for example, uh, Google Maps. Um, yeah. But then I wanted to add one thing, uh, yeah. because if you have these intermediate data players uh, combining indeed payment uh, and insurance data, you go uh, towards accounting data. Uh, we should already think about who becomes too big to fail, because we have the lesson learned of banks and financial players to be or to become too big to fail. Uh, but if you are um, having a bigger scope even, uh, we obviously see the danger already um, uh, raising. Okay. I, I would like to invite the other speakers also to give a last closing comment of something you should, that you think the Commission should take into account on the, with this outreach. Um, maybe, uh, Jean, I will start with you, because uh, uh, I know it will be harder for Rena to formulate a, a suggestion being part of uh, <laughs> the, the regulator. So, Jean, what do you think the Commission should really take into account for this, for this initiative? What's the upcoming uh, legal uh, changes? Well, I think, like 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 I said earlier on, is is uh, uh, getting more focus on the aspects of the uh, of the B two B environment uh, in uh, in upcoming uh, legislation. That's one thing, and maybe uh, don't don't leave too much interpretation room in the legislation, uh, which would lead to. Uh, to uh, potential uh, international uh, 
competition uh, by different interpretation which are done okay. uh, thank you for that country, Jean. and, and maybe I'll, I'll translate something that tina said uh, she says their bank takes a conservative standpoint when it comes to uh, what consent is and how much people know but we have whole, the whole MIFID and all the control rooms on how a bank needs to assess the knowledge of a customer when they for example they want to trade in shares is this something that you see as a possibility that banks are also going to have to test the knowledgeability of their customers when it comes to data sharing and integration i see you're listening did you hear my question reynolds yeah i heard your question okay. i thought it was in uh, Tina, no, sorry. It, no, no, sorry. It was uh, aimed at you, Renat. Sorry. Uh, just because because it's a uh, uh, MIFID is something yeah, that also came from Europe. It's an obligation for banks to check uh, to which extent their customers can can understand the financial products they're buying into. Is this something yeah. you would feel uh, useful for consent? So not the bank deciding you can't understand. Not all our customers can understand it. So we are being conservative, but maybe finding something more granular in there. I'm, I'm not I'm not wholly convinced I mean I think I think just like Jean mentioned um, first of all we are seeing that quite a few um, players in the market quite a few banks actually are are, are treating um, PSD2 still as a compliant to do task mm -hmm. uh, some for some of them far down the list of to do tasks okay. um, that's us, shocking to hear for the fintechs, of course. Yeah, I can imagine. So no, but for us, um, it's um, it's really a lot of them think that um, it's it's nice to hear that you know do we want to monetize it and we want we want to make advantage of it. But there there's sometimes there is a level of schizophrenia. Um, if we want to be on the receiving end of open banking data, but we don't want to be on the giving end. Um, and I think our main job today is to make sure that um, within the remits of the law, we are going to put on our cap of a prudential uh, supervisor, of a regulator, and, and make some do some necessary steps uh, this year to, to force those who need to be forced or nudge those who need to be nudged, to put it that way, into doing what needs to be done. In terms of resp responding to your question on the consent part, um, I think clarifications, um, and certainly for B2B environment, um, are on their way. Uh, it's been a uh, hotly debated topic um, with the EBA uh, on consent in B2B environment and how that works for payment accounts and under PSD2. Does it need to be like a MIFID test? Um, does the customer know? I mean, um, I took consumer law when I was in law school and my professor told me if you give too much information to consumers, it's the same as giving no information. When you give somebody 400 pages or 40 pages, they're not going to read it. It's the same as giving only one phrase. I'm a little bit afraid with all these with all these uh, things you have to do under MIFID, and this is my personal view, of course. With all these things you have to do under MIFID, is there you have a lot of questions to fill in, a lot of stuff. The question is, does the consumer read this, or is he opening Google Window at the same time and googling what a warrant, or what a turbo is, while completing the questionnaire? So, I mean, I can do twenty of these questionnaires without knowing. So, I don't know if that's the right way to to approach it. So, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that far. To methodizing consent. So. Okay, I, I, but we're all very happy to hear that you know the the burden of answering questions because the regulator <laughs> tends to do that the other way around too. So <laughs> we feel we're happy to learn that, that you feel the pain of long questionnaires too. Uh, with that uh, uh, meant to be funny remark, right now uh, I would like to close this uh, this session and thank both you, uh, Jean and Tine, for the interactive uh, participation and the excellent suggestion and the sharing of the insights on how uh, PZD went so far in open banking where it's going according to you and i'm going to invite our next speakers on stage and a last thank also to tina because i saw that you answered live questions um from from uh, uh, hans van deun and ornella uh, busenge so thanks for doing that part of the job on the side of being on this panel too so uh, without further ado thank you for you we're going to move to the next session uh, which uh, is talking uh, about EU uh, frameworks for markets in crypto assets. Uh, and so the next speakers are Bargare, who is a legal counsel at Euroclear, a very large uh, Brussels-based uh, uh, player, and Mark Toledo, who is the very outspoken and also uh, co-founder of bit for You, who's been into uh, all sorts of cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, and uh, who I would dare to say is an expert when it comes to all things crypto-related. 
so Mark, I don't see you on the screen yet. Now I do. Uh, welcome uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, same to you, uh, Bart. Maybe uh, uh, quickly, Bart, if we can start with you. Uh, uh, when we when we talk about crypto assets, what are, according to you, the current challenges that you face from Euroclear when you discuss this internally? Well, uh, is, is the sound okay? Yes, sound is fine. We hear you. Perfect. Perfect. So, we, uh, Euroclear has, of course, already examined technology, and uh, there we see clear benefits. Um, be it that uh, it's only, we, we, we think that uh, only certain types of, of DLT networks or blockchains uh, can be scalable. Uh, we, we can come uh, back to that later on in this discussion. But uh, the, the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest hindrance, I think, for, for developing this in a bigger scale or applying DLT on a bigger scale uh, or tokenization on a bigger scale is a legal uncertainty. So uh, I'm, I'm, I don't go that far. I don't agree with, with some of the voices in, in the crypto space who say that the current regulatory framework is, is not technology neutral. I don't agree with that. But uh, it's in any case, it's, it's, it's uh, certain that um, certain concepts which are in the existing regulation uh, could be clarified in a DL DLT context. Okay. Uh, how does these context, uh, uh, concepts apply in a DLT context? For example, the notion of account, uh, uh, the notion of, uh, of book entry, uh, of dematerialization, these type of context, uh, concepts what does it mean in a DLT context? And I think their uh, regulators at the EU level could play a role by, by issuing guidance. Uh, but I think indeed uh, legal certainty is a prerequisite uh, uh, for industry-wide adoption of, uh, of crypto assets and DLT. So that's, uh, that's certainly an action point. And that's also, I think the commission realized that that's why they made a consultation about this topic. Okay, and, and I just want to point out that DLT stands for digital ledger technologies. Huh? So not everybody is into this niche yet. Uh, so uh, I think many of the, the, the bankers that have tuned into this uh, webinar uh, will learn a lot in this uh, next uh, half hour session about what crop, cryptocurrencies and uh, crypto technology is all about. And Mark, maybe to come to you with that, it's much more when we talk about digital ledger technologies, and that's why it's a good acronym. It's a lot more than cryptocurrency. Can you maybe tell us a little bit uh, more about that? And and being uh, corrected by Olivier, it's not digital, it's distributed ledgers. So thank you for that again. We're having too many acronyms around now. Mark, uh, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, for sure. Um, we've got different technologies. What we have to know here is that there is, first of all, a definition problem. When you look on EU level, they don't even uh, can state clearly with one voice what is digital asset, what is a crypto asset, what's the central bank digital currency, uh, what is the definition of it. What I can tell you is that we have, according to me, three main axes. The first one is company development. The second one is AML, uh, terrain financing uh, uh, operations and how to counter, uh, to, 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 to play with that and uh, how to avoid it. And the third point is uh, everything that relates to consumer protection. So as you notice that there is no definition, uh, we see that there are many, many problems. We see that crypto assets, I like to call them digital assets because uh, I think uh, what the difference between a token, a security token, uh, you've got companies looking for funds, uh, it's always digital assets. For me, we should put everything under one big name, which is digital assets because they are created by public actors, they are created by private actors all over the world. And you know what? You have access to internet. Nobody prevents you to open an account with uh, an Australian uh, company, for instance. We are here thinking about EU. EU is very nice, it's very interesting for us, but we have to understand that the consumers are using internet. They can transfer, they can exchange, they can trade all digital assets on websites that looks attractive to them. We are very restrictive, for instance, at Bit4U when considering onboarding a customer. And some of our customers say, oh, we prefer to go on the Chinese platform because we can trade on Chinese platforms. And uh, you, you, they don't ask uh, us any uh, sorts of fun questions as you do in Belgium. So we have to take the problem, first of all, globally. So we have, first of all, uh, EU uh, national regul regulatory initiatives that are different when you look at France, Malta, 
Luxembourg are very attractive. For instance, us, a bit for you, when we want to provide certain services, uh, we should apply for a French li license, but the French license won't be recognized for products offered in Germany. And uh, we are on the internet, and can you imagine the real burden it is for us just to try to understand uh, what is the EU doing for the moment? For what we really think is that ESMA has got a central role to play on coordination on all regulations, but not only on national regulations, but also on the application of national regulations. Uh, when you speak about uh, AML, uh, we speak about AML D5, you know that it has got yeah. to be into force in the 10th of January 2020. Where are we in Belgium? <laughs> we have nothing yet uh, in application, so it is very difficult for us to work. You know, we have deployed a lot uh, uh, of features. Um, we are MLD5 ready by nature, by design, for two years. But it's very difficult for us uh, to try to find contact points. We really need that ESMA should do something on coordination of all these national uh, initiatives, because we see also a lot of arbitrage. When you speak about EU, we see arbitrage on regulations. But you know what? Uh, most of my friends told me, Mark, are you crazy to do an exchange in Belgium? You should do it in Singapore. You can open a company in a few minutes. You don't have any questions. And we could do it. We could just move the domain on Singapore. It takes five minutes. We register a company in one day, and it's over. So we could offer, as our competitors do, products that are forbidden. You, you can uh, offer a binary trading, short sell, everything. Uh, do not ask any question about the source of funds. So it's very difficult for us to cope with this international competition. We really need already in EU to have a strong EU uh, acting with international standards. When you look, uh, uh, just to finish that, because I see that Bart has got some things to say, speaking about AML D5, when you compare it to international standards, we are already totally outdated. You know what? You know, by the time of writing the MLD5 and implementing that, it's already totally outdated. So, can you give yeah. an example about how anti money laundering, uh, the, the directive uh, version 5, is being already uh, well, I, taken? I, I give you, I give you uh, one, one, uh, one example. We really yes. think, think that fighting against uh, the crime is really important. And we do fight every day against fraud, different type of fraud. There is one single rule that should be applied here. All over the world, people are KYC somewhere. So, if you oblige uh, to the EU and all EU consumers and all international consumers to apply the travel rule, so that means that each transaction should bear your identification. You can be identified. You think that being identifiable and trustable, would you still continue doing fraud on the internet? It will be much more difficult. So, the FATF travel rule is something that should be applied here in Europe, just to give you an example. Okay, great. Now, uh, I'm going to let you react, back to because many things have already been said. Uh, I'm interested in your opinion about those two. Uh, yes, although we have different perspectives. Yes. Eh? Um, Mark is, is representing a fintech here, and me, myself, an incumbent financial institution. I think we share the same concern here, namely the fact that there is not a harmonized approach at the EU level. Um, and then what you see is that uh, countries are, are doing a, what I call regulatory competition. Um, some of the EU countries are trying to profile themselves in, in the fintech space by being more quicker in the implementation, for example, of AML D5, but also in the creation of bespoke frameworks for this new type of, of service providers. Uh, but I think AML D5, uh, which uh, has provisions concerning virtual asset service providers and and digital assets indeed it's still Ali the scope is very limited eh? it's indeed uh, about uh, KYC and registration of these service providers but uh, there is much more uh, that is needed to be able uh, to to allow uh, for for crypto assets and tokenization to be widely adopted in the financial industry because this is only about onboarding clients, uh, um, anti-money laundering, uh, basically. So uh, I think I think discussion is, is much broader than that. That's, that's also why the consultation of the European Commission was much, much broader. Yes. It also uh, went into, uh, do we need changes to MIFID? Do we need uh, changes to CSDR, uh, which is the, 
the regulation on central securities depositories like Euroclear? Do we need to changes to the settlement finality directive and uh, and so on? Um, and I think indeed, uh, like Mark, Mark also pointed out, legal certainty is a prerequisite. So uh, the European Commission will have to do something. The question is more what 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 will be the uh, the the extent of its intervention. Yeah. And there, uh, I think we need to distinguish between different types of crypto assets. Uh, Mark already hinted to that as well. Uh, there are various types of crypto assets. You have the cryptocurrencies, which are best known by the public, and the bitcoins and the like, the ethers. But then uh, you have, of course, a wide range of crypto assets, which has maybe more uh, potential use cases in the financial in industry, like, for example, uh, securities tokens. Yeah? Uh, which can be native, which means that they are issued directly on the blockchain, uh, which can be asset backed, so backed by traditional securities. And that is where, where your case focuses on these securities tokens, of course. Uh, we, we don't look so much at cryptocurrencies because of their high volatility. And uh, as a, a central securities depository, we have still the, the objective of pursuing financial stability, so this volatility doesn't work then. But if you look at securities tokens, there uh, what we need at EU level is, first of all, a, a clear asset classification. Because if you read papers on crypto assets today, you will read in every paper, you will find another classification. Um, and so, first of all, the classification of the assets in terms of economic function of the asset. But then also, what is the legal classification of these types of assets? Because, and then you, if you, if you do that exercise, you will see that you will not need a brand new legal framework for every type of crypto assets. For example, uh, uh, securities tokens. There are securities tokens which have the same features as transferable securities today. They're just issued in a token form, which means the only difference with a, with a share or a bond today is that they are issued on another technology, be it a distributed ledger technology. And the fact that you use technology does not mean that another framework should apply because the underlying reason for a legal framework is always the pursuance of certain policy objectives like investor protection, financial stability, market integrity. And these, these policy objectives, they remain relevant eh? this, irrespective of which technologies you use. So for example, for securities, which have the same features as transferable securities on the MIFID today, uh, they can perfectly be, be issued under the current legal framework, be it with some clarifications from the regulator as to how you have to apply certain requirements and, con and concepts in this new context. But you will not need a, a whole new framework with new requirements because it's the same type of asset with the same risks for the financial system, with the same risks for the investor. So let's just leverage what we already have. Eh? Um, and then for other types of crypto assets, like, for example, uh, central bank digital currencies or other stable coins being tokens which are backed by, by other assets underlying cash or traditional securities there. I can imagine that the Euro European Commission will go in the direction of, of a bespoke legal framework, a new legal framework, because the, these, these are assets eh, which we don't know yet today. Uh, Okay, you have of course uh, the, the euro itself, but we don't we don't have it in a, in a in a purely digital form. So I can imagine that there there will be a need for a legal framework eh? because in in essence you could say that a stable coin or a CBDC, uh, if it's backed by securities, you could say ah, it takes the form of a depository receipt mm -hmm. like we know it today. But it isn't a depository receipt because it has another function. Eh? A CBDC or a stablecoin has a payment function, not an investment function. So that, that's why I think for this type of crypto assets, there is a, a void in legislation. There will be a need to, to regulate, I think. But for, for the other type of securities tokens, let's just leverage what we have and provide clarity to the financial sector eh? so that they can so that they can start using this technology and, and uh, and uh, using the benefits of it to the benefit of the market. Okay. Um, cryptocurrencies is also a specific type which may be, which will need maybe a bespoke legal framework because of its high volatility. Uh, but we already see frameworks eh, in some of the member states and there will be the challenge 
of uh, at European level to harmonize that again okay. and to to avoid this regulatory competition uh, between member states. Okay. Thank you, Bart, for that very extensive and interesting explanation. Maybe Mark, Mark, your reaction to that because the, the, about the the classification. Uh, of those assets about the bespoke model what, what are you what are your, uh, your views on that i think uh, that uh, you know we are on internet we trade through internet you can trade anything on internet you can buy a house you can buy a car you can buy a service you can buy a lot of things so what if i buy you know uh, my son is playing not my son but uh, one of uh, the friend the son of my friends is playing fortnite fortnite it's a fantastic game where they got virtual money called v bucks V bucks you can buy um, suits, but it has no value for in the real world. But I can tell you that those little gamers do spend a lot of money just to acquire additional V bucks among themselves. So that means that you can exchange everything. And today, what we see is that in practice, it is not always clear if a crypto asset or digital asset effectively falls inside the scope of an existing regulatory framework. So we should broaden that as much as possible because tomorrow companies may be able to finance themselves through internet through SEO, for instance and uh, they could also may lend money so it will be another use of the money but it's always exchanging so you can exchange everything as, uh, against something so for instance if i've got um, let's say lend some money to bart i can sell you that right to get the money back from bart on a digital way, as we do in the, the today. So, which uh, legislation are you going to apply for that? Is that digital money? Is that an asset? Is that a token? So, we have to look at a broader scale, more on everything that has got a value. If you've got a value, it's an asset. If an asset can be exchanged, traded, it has got to be controlled on a certain way regarding consumer protection, regarding AML, FT. We've got to control that so we should be very clear on the financial definitions that's what's on the most important thing on the financial regulatory framework is to make it easy to understand because the more complex you go the more ways to escape you give also to the people so make it broader and that's very very important is that uh, so the, the the regulations on the, the crypto assets for the moment are just based on the characteristics and I, as you may understand, the tar characteristics of the financial instruments can be uh, very, very uh, different according to the paper work that you made uh, uh, around it. Okay, thanks for that one. I'm, I'm just going to share a small technical alert message here because I got a two-hour uh, alerts, but I think it's fine. If, if there would be an issue, we will post a new URL in the chat uh, windows for everybody following this because there was some two-hour limit to the recording, I'm, I'm afraid, but I think our session can continue. We'll see how this pans out. Um, if we uh, uh, co come back to the questions and the chat that are being used, we see some very strong uh, statements like from David Schmitz, like using new technology with the same actors is like doing nothing. Uh, is this a feeling that you share, Mark? That the <laughs> existing... So there is a, a, a David Schmitz who knows you clearly. He says, using new technologies with the same actors is like doing nothing. <laughs> is this something you relate to or you say uh, I'm, I'm, you're, you're, you have a more nuanced view on that? Um, I see what David is, is uh, doing. He says that if we concentrate the technology and the regulation to put it in the hands of uh, the same players of uh, yesterday, so there will be no change. So if you want to make a change in the world, you've got to give access to the competition to those technologies. When you hear that uh, uh, the banks, and I clearly can understand that they try to protect their APIs, uh, the way to get access to their data, I can really understand that. But is it a way to improve competition? Okay, and and uh, Bart, you you're being more about those yeah. same actors. What is your reaction to this sort of quotes well, or critique? No, I, I think it's I think it's a mix. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, what I've been told by my colleagues from innovation is that innovation is is basically taking two uh, two things together, maybe one two existing things, and making a new thing out of it. Uh, so you have a new technology here. Uh, and, and you have the incumbents on one side and the fintech on the other, but uh, they can perfectly cooperate eh? uh, because, and that's what also what we see when we when we talk to fintechs uh, in the field of DLT and tokenization, 
is that they they are also seeking, uh, uh, for example, your clear's experience, uh, uh, operational experience in, in, in respect of settlement processes, eh, for example. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's if, if eh, I think it's an end uh, story. Um, for example, um, what what is sometimes said, yeah, and then then I'm purely talking about uh, the process of security settlement, uh, where uh, they are also fintech looking at uh, putting uh, the, the settlement of securities on DLT, and then of course the idea in the beginning of of the public blockchain was uh, full decentralization and disintermediation. But then you you have to ask yourself the question: Does it does this work? Does this benefit the market as a whole? That's the question, because what is what is it's not regulation does not exist in order to uh, just to prevent uh, business from from arising. It exists because there are certain legitimate interests that needs to be protected, eh? uh, and one of these interests is, for for example, financial stability. And you can financial stability uh, has, has several sub components. One of these sub components is for for example legal risk. Eh? Uh, the market, uh, all participants in the capital markets, they want to, that ca that legal risk is as much as possible mitigated. And what is legal risk? For example, the fact that is if someone sells a security to another party uh, and that the transaction settles, then they want to be sure that in fact this transaction can no longer be reversed. If, for example, one of the if the other the, if the counterpart would uh, would would come become bankrupt, for example. And that's where we are today. A security settlement system uh, jumps in, eh? and they say at a certain point in time, at a point in time defined by their rules, the, the transaction is final and it cannot can no longer be reversed. Maybe it is a good and time also so to interrupt you. I'll, I'll put a live question on there from uh, Olivier Rouclou, which is what do you think about the potential obligation of having your digital security and tokens under custody of a specialized firm? I'm just hinting at Euroclear as potentially being one of those specialized firms. And why is a hardware wallet not enough? Maybe Bart, if you can answer that first and I'll, I'll pass it on to Marta. Yeah, um, well, indeed, that, that's 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 why where I wanted to come to that uh, that the incumbent financial institutions they will certainly be able to play a role, and uh, the new technology may may uh, may lead in the, in the long term I think to restructuring of of the, of the financial markets, uh, and it's possible that uh, actors traditional actors will take up new roles like uh, wallet providers, for example. Indeed, uh, central securities depositories or global custodians, they could be a wallet provider because they are used to uh, to hold assets for, for clients. So they could be, so I think, but the, the technology that you use will have, to, will need certain controls built in. So I'm, I'm not, I'm certainly not convinced that the public blockchain will, will be scalable in the financial markets, but as another type of blockchain will, like a permissioned one where with, for example, distributed validation. That's a potential model, a uh, model with potential in financial markets. And uh, incumbents will need to reinvent themselves. I don't. I think it's not an, uh, an if story. It's uh, fintech and incumbents together. Yeah, Mark, if you want yeah, to... Yeah, I see uh, Tuna was muted. Uh, he was speaking, but uh, we didn't listen to him. Um, yes, Mark, you are totally right. And I think that uh, collaboration between incumbents and uh, fintechs is a, a, a real uh, asset here uh, in Europe because if we want to face world and global challenges, we, work, we have to work uh, together. The advantage of uh, the incumbents is that they've got already a very large uh, customer base. The advantage of fintechs is that they are very, very flexible and uh, that can react uh, very fast. I would like just uh, to stress one thing that uh, I read uh, yes, again uh, yesterday about the, the ESMA. They, they, they stress that the legal uncertainty surrounding all the, the crypto assets is also an obstruction to the development of a sustainable ecosystem. And that's exactly the, the point. So for us, it will be a, a real uh, uh, interest uh, to work with a company like Euroclear to show them how we can uh, make uh, the transaction non-reversible, how we can store them, use uh, hybrid solutions uh, it's just a matter of a few guys when you look at an incumbent uh, can you tell me bart i don't know if it's a secret how many uh, people are leading the program three people four people not so much more i mean on the it side intelligent side so there are always a bunch of very very few actors doing all the 
job of the innovation and how to, uh, to, uh, to apply it to a large number of customers. So that's why I think that uh, large players, large banks have got a real uh, cards to play today by thinking about the, the size of their database, the size of a customer base, and to see how they can market new products, not only defend their existing market share, and I can understand that, you know, I'm going from the telecom industry. I was the, the, the smallest operator against the, the, all the large incumbents, so I know very well the story. And if you are bringing additional uh, value to the incumbents, we can improve the, the, the solutions for the consumer, we can improve the solutions for the competition, we can improve a lot of things. And moreover, I'm quite convinced that uh, DLT or crypto or CBDCs, name it as you want, it will be a real advantage in the future to lower criminality, to uh, lower the taxes. Uh, uh, just one thing, if you can trust all the money, no black money will be uh, in, uh, in, game, in the game anymore. So that means that in Belgium, we speak about 15 to 16% of parallel economy. If you just wipe it out, so that will come back on a certain way. So people paying taxes again. So that means that all the people in, in Belgium could pay less taxes by using that kind of technology. Uh, when I speak with